What up, what up, what up? Guys, Preston Smiles here, Questions with Preston, and I am excited to introduce to you guys somebody, if you have not met this guy, you've been under a rock, but this is Koi <laughs> Fresco. Yeah, if, you, you if you're not following him, you get to go to his channel ASAP. It'll be down in the link below. Click on that, hit subscribe, then come right back to this video. Or watch this video, then subscribe. But either or, either or, <laughs> make sure you watch. Um, as you guys know, uh, this channel is called Questions with Preston, and so we uh, oftentimes will sit down and just dive into Q and A stuff. And and uh, Koi, who has a pretty big following, got some questions from his followers on Instagram, and I also got some from mine. And so I say we dive right in Let's do it. and and Let's see it. see what comes through. Um, we had a question about being with somebody who feels entitled. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? I think entitlement is a tricky subject because, and I've experienced this too myself, most of us experience a sense of entitlement, whether mm -hmm. it's on the phone with customer service, yes. or, you know, especially working in a restaurant, <laughs> it made me realize all the times before I worked in a restaurant that I had had that kind of sense of entitlement going into yeah. an establishment like that because we have this incorrect perception of hierarchy in human life. Right? Yeah. We're all intertwined, we're all interconnected, all is one uh, in a sense, but because of our status, our social roles, the way Western, the Western world is, we, we have this incorrect perception that I deserve this, mm -hmm. that I should get this, that yeah. things should go my way, and that anything that does not directly align with what I am wanting, Boom. is wrong and that I should not accept it. Yeah. It's basically, it's, it's less entitlement, more stubbornness than anything. It's mm -hmm. an unwillingness to change or unwillingness to see things in a new perspective. And when we're with somebody, especially in a relationship or in a friendship where people feel senses of entitlement, it, it really, it can get to us as well. It can really mm -hmm. frustrate us because we often see a reflection of where we've been entitled in our life, yeah. in those relationships, <laughs> in the past, or we, we, we really just want to, again, fix them. We think they're wrong. We think something's wrong yes. with them. We want to Which fix is it. also a sense of entitlement. Exactly. Yeah. So or it, stubbornness. Or... So it creates this kind of like headbutting of, yeah. of two senses of entitlement, one just, one unjust to our perception. Yeah. So the biggest thing we can do is really sit down with the person and try to understand why they think this way, mm -hmm. what aspect of life and, and why they are, are sober in this sense. And that's hard to have a conversation on, like you said, deep levels yes. like that. Really sitting down and talking. How come when we discuss these, how come when we want to go out here, how come when we're doing this thing, mm -hmm. you always have to put yourself first. You always have to negate my emotions or mm -hmm. my ideas. And, and this is one of the fundamental ways we can help them. You know, we shouldn't be trying to fix everything about them at once. Yeah. What we want to do is help them understand that we are feeling a reaction to, to their activities, exactly. to their sayings. Yeah, and let me piggyback this and just go in a different angle. It also assumes that that's true, mm -hmm. and it may not be true. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, what we perceive to be entitlement in another is actually our own yes. stuff that we're not getting our way, and therefore we perceive this person to be narcissistic or entitled or whatever the case may be. However, if this is true with a capital T, right, if it's true for you at least, I would suggest that you explain. Um, through nonviolent communication that when certain things happen the story you make up about it is that's bit that's that's less that's less blaming and shaming and more about uh, just an event that you add meaning to because at that point and, and all of us have been there where somebody has come to us with particular languaging about what we did or didn't do and the moment they do that, the moment there's an offense, it creates a defense. Instantly. We want to justify it. all Boom. that we did and all that we thought in yes. those occurrences. Yes. And that's why it's so important to, again, try to find a neutral space to sit down and open up and be fragile. You know, they, they will, we that's... react to entitlement when people can open up to us and be, be vulnerable with us. Yeah. And I've learned this in the past, you know, when you can sit down with somebody and say, look, in these situations, I've been feeling this way. Yeah. I've been perceiving it this way. How have you been perceiving it? How did yep. you feel in that, yes. in that situation? Yes. Is, is that why you might have acted in this way? Is that why I might have reacted to that? It really helps both parties see it not as an offensive defensive thing, yes. but really as just a curiosity of, okay, let's find Wonder common ground. and curiosity. And now it's not like this, it's like this. Exactly. Now we're both staring at something going, huh, that's interesting. I'm curious about that as well, as opposed to, well, this thing happened because of you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? And you have to see my perspective Boom. or else you're wrong. Yep. So that, like you said, that's entitlement, hitting entitlement unconsciously. Yep. So we have to be able to sit down with compassion and speak about it lovingly and being open to it. And if, if that person isn't receptive to it at first, 
that's understandable. That's oftentimes we yes. create that internal defense. Yeah. But the more you do it, the more you pursue it over the couple of days, couple of weeks, these people begin to open up. Absolutely. Almost always. Because inherently, all of us are loving humans. Yes. Right? They're, everybody has a positive intent. Hitler had a positive intent. It wasn't positive to most of us. But in his perspective. But in his perspective, it was a positive intent. And so, if we can really come back to an understanding that everybody's doing the best they can from where they can with the tools and consciousness they have available at that given moment, then there's space for compassion. There's space and there's room for, for, for them to show up differently. You know, we, we create linguistically, we create people with, our, with how we perceive them. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to see them outside of them being the villain or the victim or the hero when we have, we've already painted that picture for them. Yeah, the moment we decide what their archetype is and yes. what they are, we almost always stay with that. Unless yes. we force ourselves to sit down with ourselves yes. and kind of deconstruct that notion. Yep, for sure. All right, next question. Uh, somebody asks how to balance masculine and feminine energy. Mm, that's an amazing question. I actually just did a workshop at Shakti Fest um, mm. about a month ago talking about masculine and feminine energy because Shakti is the divine feminine, the energy of the universe portrayed that way. The biggest thing I can think to the hyper-masculine world we live in in the West, mm -hmm. which is which is rampant, you know, mm -hmm. especially in America, with, yeah. with politics right now, with, with the justice system, there's, <laughs> there's hyper-masculinity everywhere. The biggest thing that we can do, in my opinion, is, is to embrace vulnerability as mm -hmm. a tool. Mm -hmm. Because to many men growing up from our fathers or their, our grandfathers, we are told basically in a masculine way to be hard, to yes. be strong. Yes. And if we do not embody that always, if we don't always figure things out on our own, mm -hmm. we're seen as weak. You know, asking for help is weak in this sense. Yeah. But what you really come to learn, especially when you begin to make your own way or if you're, you know, finding your own spiritual path or being an entrepreneur, is that if you're not vulnerable, you're going to fail. You yeah. have to be able to, to mess up, to get help, to understand yes. things. Yes. So vulnerability is an amazing tool for the male complex embracing the, the feminine mm -hmm. side of existence. Uh, I would say in, in, the, in the flip side for, for the overly feminine to embrace the masculine mm -hmm. is again really just to f fill in more to the practice of independence. Yeah. To kind of finding a way to work on your own but not always being reliant, yes. right? Not always being vulnerable. Yes, 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 for sure. Yeah, I'll add to that and piggyback that with I, I'm not somebody who subscribes to the idea of balance. Mm. I don't think that anything is ever completely in balance. I think it's always shifting, moving, and changing. It's and like so, yes, exactly. It's, it's always ebbing and flowing. And so when we get into this idea of trying to make things balanced and equal and perfect in that sense, uh, we are in a lose-lose conversation because, they'll, in my opinion, there'll never be the universe. Nothing lands. Nothing is actually sitting still. If we take a microscope and, and place it over, over Koi's arm and break it down, it's just energy vibrating in a space. That's not still, right? We, we've all agreed that this is a, there's a human here and his name is Koi and all of that stuff. But like the truth of the matter is, is that we're energy in a space. And so this idea of a balancing the masculine and the feminine, I don't even play that game. What I'm more interested in is um, wielding both of those energies when they are necessary. Yes. Right. So, so the the masculine being um, direct, uh, sort of logic, reason, structure. The feminine being flow, creativity, uh, divine, you know, sacred energy that's in flux and moving and changing and shifting. Asking myself at any given moment, what is necessary of me? What aspect of myself? what I need to tap into in order to fill this situation with whatever I believe or want to show up on the other side of that. Mm. So the game for me is playing, you know, with what's what's being called of me right now and how can I step into that? Yeah, and it's, it's not about being, you know, completely balanced in every situation yeah. because some situations require a much more feminine approach yes. while others require yeah. a much more masculine approach. Yeah. Like we said, like I had an event last night where someone thought I was breaking into my own van, you know, so... With those situations, uh, if we are trying to be in help a situation, we might want to find balance and go be curious, ask, ask questions. But if we can see something's going wrong, someone's breaking windows or actually yeah. trying to get into a van, the more masculine approach wants us to approach it, be direct, understand yeah. what's going on, see this, this thing, this yeah. 
wrong is that's occurring to our perspective. So 100%. it's all it's all subjective to the exact situation we're in, and that's where we can find the balance. Yep. But by embracing you know both sides mm-hmm. and coming to know them, that helps us dictate when True. each should take True. I guess prominence uh, yeah. in in life. Yeah. So so we'd have to go into them, and and to go into them would require not being balanced, mm. but actually falling deep into the feminine or deep into the masculine in order to know its opposite. You can't tell me about uh, cold without me having an experience of warm or hot. Yes. Right? You can't tell me about left if I don't have an understanding or a concept about right. They, have, they, they need each other in order to even exist. All right, next question. Somebody asked about synchronicity and divine timing. What's your, what's your opinion on that? How do you view with those statements? So, you know, there's a lot of new age linguistic terminology around the ideas of synchronicity, Carl Jung's perspective on synchronicity uh, versus, you know, how him and Freud would always butt heads on the idea of it even being a thing. I really think, in my opinion, and your might, yours might be different, that synchronicity is just our intuition becoming aware of a situation happening for a reason that we can find, a meaning that we can find reason in. Right? Yes. yes. So that, that's, I don't know if that's how you see that's it. That's great. But yes. That's how I see really it. It's just good, bro. so much happens every day. Everything is happening. Divine timing is timing itself. All of it. It always is. This guy's good. When our He's intuition good. becomes aware of it, yeah. that is what synchronicity is. It's right. our intuition going, something's here. Yes. Now, the problem with that is that sometimes, we might not perceive it correctly. We might take the wrong route mm-hmm. or do something that doesn't make it into anything more. Yeah. But that's really just where it is. It is your intuitive nature, your true self, the, the transcendental self, the, the divine nature, kind of seeing that this moment is something. And what yeah. that something is, I have to decipher and discover. But there's something here that I can pay attention to or yeah. embrace or go deeper into. Mm-hmm. And that to me is what intuition and divine timing is. You know, we, we both had breakfast this morning together and we ran into a friend mm-hmm. out of anywhere they could have been in the world yep. today in LA at the same restaurant at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've all been kind of talking about working together in some sense. So that again is a, when that happened, the intuition goes, okay, here's yep. an interesting interaction. Yep. What can happen here? How can, what can we do with this? Yes. Can we use this yeah. in, in a progressive way? For sure. And that, that to me is what synchronicity is. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I wholeheartedly align with that and I'm just going to add some more. You know, the way that the human ego works sometimes is we want to compartmentalize areas of our lives. Mm. We want to say, well, you know, I became spiritual on this date and this is when synchronicities and divine timing started happening, right? Where I woke up and then I started noticing A, B, C, D, and G. Mm. And I think that if all of us really were to look at our lives, whenever, you know, we're always manifesting and calling things in. Right? And, and the universe, God, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, Jesus, whatever name is most potent for you, is not necessarily speaking English. It's not translating English. It's translating vibration. It's translating what your heart of hearts is asking for at any given moment. Right? And so... You're energetically feeling. Yes. And so, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll you know, intuitively and, and intentionally ask for a certain scenario, um, which is to experience more of myself in love, right? And so, so, so then the ego mind will go, okay, well that means I'm gonna be sent, you know, a person and I'm gonna meet him in the grocery store and I'm gonna fall in love and he's gonna meet my parents and everybody's gonna love each other, right? That's how the ego makes up the whole story about that love conversation. Hmm. While the universe, God, Buddha, Allah, Krishna, Jesus, whatever name is most potent for you, has a whole different uh, set of circumstances that may, you know, uh, that most likely don't apply to the ego mind's specific exactly, exactly. expectation of how that synchronicity will play out. Exactly. So then, you know, to learn about love, sometimes we need to understand uh, the version of it in this body, mm. what we would call its opposite, which does there has no opposite in, in the philosophical standpoint. Yeah. But if we're talking about like human to human, we would believe the opposite of love would be hate or fear, whatever the case may be. So the universe may send you a scenario that doesn't appear to be that. Mm. And in that, one may say, well, you know, I messed up my manifestation. I, I, I screwed it up, this is what I asked for. However, looking at that scenario, let's say, let's, I'm gonna give you, and I'm gonna do this really quickly. You ask for love. You ask for, for to, you know, to call in your one. And three weeks later, you meet a uh, person let's call it a guy, who uh, appears to be on the surface that for you. And you guys start dating, 
and you fall madly in love. You rise in love and it's beautiful and it's amazing and then a few months later things start to fall apart. The masks start coming off and you find out that this guy cheated on you. Right? It's just giving you a scenario when statistically women are cheating more than men at this point right now but like that's a whole nother <laughs> Side like tangent, more. exactly. But so he cheated on you, right? And then you go, Oh, the universe, I asked for this and I didn't get my one, mm -hmm. right? And so then we, we play the game called, like, Okay, well, that's done. Now I'm restarting my ask. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to point out is, is that there is no restart of the ask. Mm -hmm. The universe had that set up from the beginning. And then when you do meet your one, let's say two years later, in a synchronistic moment, you go, oh, well, that was based on this. Well, no, it was based on the whole damn thing because it never stopped. And it, the big thing is if, yeah. we don't, if we don't allow ourselves to be open to those times of trial and yes. trouble, if we don't learn from that, we can miss that one that comes in the future. A, a perfect quote that I think encapsulates what you're trying to say is Baba Ram Dass, who's the Harvard psychologist who found Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji and learned from him um, in the spiritual sense. And he would always say that suffering is grace and hiding. Mm. That was one of his favorite quotes. Mm. Suffering is grace and hiding. Yes. So all the things that go wrong, that don't seem like divine timing or synchronistic yep. happenings, that doesn't mean they're going to be sunshine and rainbows. Yes. They're going to be dirt and blood and tears. Yes. And those things are all divine too. That is yes. all grace if we can open ourselves up to the suffering yep. as a teacher. Absolutely. Always. So many of us are praying for rain, but then we complain about the mud. Exactly. And that's, that, that's the thing. It's like... We want rain, but not too much rain. Yeah, yeah. Like, like too much rain, but yeah. we're mad that we got it. Yes. And that's the problem. Exactly. It's too muddy out here. Like, and that's why, that's why expectations will harm us. And that's why you can't have expectations with bro. things like synchronicity. Yep. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right. Last one. Okay, this is a great one. How, how do we stay grounded in yep. daily life? Because most of us feel like... The environments we're in, the people we're around, mm -hmm. they uproot us. Mm -hmm. they, they, they make it so we can't become grounded. How would mm -hmm. you say we, we stay grounded in daily life? <sighs> well, I mean, here's the thing. All of this is a practice, right? It's all ceremony. Mm -hmm. It's all prayer. And, and I think the difference is, is that some of us don't recognize or in, bring intentionality around our days. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not... You know, we're not perceiving it as a ceremony. We're not perceiving it as that. So the, the easiest way to say this is practices. Mm -hmm. What practices do you have in place that would create a space where you truly remember who and what you are? Mm -hmm. So you don't get sucked into the matrix and the thought of you not being, you know, having the lips like the Kardashians or mm -hmm. money like so-and-so or whatever you're comparing yourself to, right? Because we... We do this as humans. We compare. And we that's how the ego discovers what it is, is by comparing. Yes. It, it found, finds its foundation in saying, I'm not this, I'm not that, yeah. I want this, I want that, I don't have this, I, I do have that. Yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. What's grounded is that when we, if we can't find balance in that, mm -hmm. we just keep seeking and keep floating away from our source. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, so for me, it's nature. I surf mm -hmm. as much as possible. I get in the water. I get in the woods. I beat my chest. I do primal screams. Mm -hmm. I drink a bunch of water. I have green juices. I, I play a lot. I have fun. I skateboard. Mm -hmm. I just do anything that's actually fun. I think a lot of us, especially in the spiritual community, have forgot that play is a part of this thing too. Mm -hmm. Like that joy fill, that, that childlike wonder and curiosity about the smallest, most stupidest things that just take us, yeah. like allowing ourselves to be taken. I do that as much as possible on a daily basis. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we look back with such nostalgia on childhood is because yes. the only difference between growing up as a kid mm -hmm. and being an adult is that we've subscribed to the rules that adults set for each other. Yes. Right? On, on the fun level, on the enjoyment yes. level. As kids, we don't care, right? Yeah. We, we ignore that. We know it's ridiculous. Yeah. But then we get convinced over the next decade or so yeah. that it, you gotta take it seriously. Yeah. And the moment you start taking life seriously, in any sense, if you can't see it all as a game that you can learn to play with and help with and understand and grow with, yeah. you get stuck into this is a big drama. And Alan Watts would always talk about this, right? We, we get caught in seeing life as a drama, mm -hmm. when in reality it's a dance. Yes. It's a dance. And what we need yes. to be dancing every day. So the same thing I do is I, I, I do what uh, Timothy Leary always says is he goes, surround yourself with sacred objects mm. and spiritual things, mm. and spiritual people. Mm. So what do I have? Around my apartment, I have tons of little things that keep me mindful. I have, I have tattoos, you know, who, who am I? Yes. Different notifications on my own hand, just an illusion. Those help me come back all yes. the time. You know, so it's, it's, 
putting reminders wherever you need them to be to help you come back to source and being that space of love and enjoyment. And if you can do that often enough, like you said, it becomes second nature. It becomes yes. part of what you are. Yes. And then life is that game from there on out. Boom. It just might take a while in the beginning to get yourself into that mental space of understanding and accepting once again, like you did growing up, that it is a game. And that we should be here to thrive and enjoy it. Yes. Not here to suffer and judge and, and cry, essentially. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. yes. I, I perceive it to be as it was stacking moments on top of each other. Mm. And we stack enough moments on top of each other that it's f like infused with pregnant, with curiosity, wonder, play, harmony, joy, all that stuff, that that becomes a new normal and, and that becomes where you vibrate from. And, and, and not, not that you don't have experiences where you experience, you know, anger, sadness, um, and, and all these other feelings, but that's not where you live at. Exactly. Which most of us do incorrectly. We, we see yes. the happy times, the joyous times. Vacation. As, as, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the opposite, right? Yes. That, that's the problem. Is we think of, of the suffering as the normality and the joy as the temporal, when in reality it should be flipped around. The only reason we suffer is because we get stuck in these ideas of how things should be because of what we've been taught. Yes. And once we get out of that, we see that that, that is not the case. That 100 percent opposite of what reality is. <laughs> Guys, if you are not following this dude, or if you are following him, I, I know you get it. But like, and and those of you watching this on Facebook, uh, he's on YouTube, so you're gonna have to go over to YouTube and hit subscribe. Like, this guy is a beast. Like, Thank you, brother. Really, really, really enjoyed this conversation. Enjoyed our mm -hmm. breakfast. Like. Brother to brother, like mm, thank you. you know, I, I don't want to pay too much attention to your number, mm. but like this, you're a kid. Like at, at what are you, 25? 25. At 25 years old, I was basically eating my own boogers, and this <laughs> dude is freaking a beast. So uh, make sure you subscribe, and uh, yeah, I'm just truly grateful for each and every one of you. Um, I know that you're loved and seen, and that you are loved. Mm -hmm. Love is your nature, and you, you have to remember that as often as you can. Boom. Love you guys. Peace. Oh.